Welcome to session 38 of Introduction to the Hebrew Bible as we look at the apostasy of Solomon. Way more exciting than the wisdom of Solomon. Who, who cares about wisdom? I want to hear about the apostasy. That's what I'm, I'm here for. Uh, yeah, especially since it has to do with his women. Yeah, always. It's those women leading him astray as women are wont to do. Uh. <sighs> Clearly. <laughs> So let's go ahead and begin with a word of prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. With you. Let us pray. Grant, O oh God, that your holy and life-giving spirit may so move every human heart, and especially the hearts of the people of this land, that barriers which divide us may crumble, suspicions disappear, and hatred cease, that our divisions being healed, we may live in justice and peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Maisie, calm down. It's just Rob out there. Goodness gracious. Um, she's just saying amen. Like, yeah, she's, a, she's, she's <laughs> is praying in the spirit. She's ready for it. Um, reminding you of our texts we're using in First and Second Kings, particularly Nelson's excellent commentary on these books, which is guiding a lot of my work. Um, and uh, let's do some review. Um, when was it? that the books of first and second Kings were divided into two. Oh, 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 oh. Now, no, you don't have to say, know the exact date, but there's something that was happening at that time that caused the division. What did it have something to do, do with the Septuagint or something? Nicely done when the Gosh. Hebrew Bible was translated into the Greek Septuagint. Fascinating, fantastic job. Uh, what is the span of history? covered by first and second kings well it's a really long time yeah um, I, you know, I gotta i gotta take notes man i know right <laughs> it's uh, the transition from david to solomon all the way the, through the division of the kingdom and then ending with the babylonian exile oh wow that is long yeah, yeah so really it is the entire existence of the monarchy um you know once you get to um you know well, from Solomon through the end of the monarchy, really for all intents and purposes. Yeah, it's just a wow. few hundred years, though. And, uh, Actually, and it split like into two kingdoms almost immediately. Yeah, we, we, assuming we would assume that, you know, generally we date King, the time of Solomon to the 10th century. Um, and so assuming it's a 10th century, you're talking about a period of probably around 400 years um, around that, um, give or take some, um, <laughs> probably around a 400 year period of time. Um, which of course, in the great scheme of things is not that long. You know, the earth is only 6,000 years old after all. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. Um, the books of first and Heresy. second Kings, <laughs> the books of first and second Kings are often seen as part of what history, there's a certain version of history that exists in the Bible what, what that these fit right into who, what would we call what do we call that part of that that version of history deuteronomic yes yes the deuteronomic history um like joshua judges the books of samuel it seems to reflect the concerns of the book of deuteronomy that would be the version of the torah that was either found or created during the reign of josiah depending on how seriously you want to take the biblical narrative um but the, that's the, the concerns that kind of pervade this book um and what is the theological question behind the history of these books remember we talked about that these aren't just interested in telling us the history of the kings but the history of the kings for the purpose of explaining a theological question the, the splitting of israel or the deconstruction <laughs> both yes the the, the division of his of israel and as well the exile what, what were the religious and moral failures that led to the exile the loss of the promised land the loss of the united kingdom all of those things those are kind of at the heart of the concern um, of these books um wonderful and let's review a little bit from first kings chapter one what does the story of abishag at the beginning of the book of first kings suggest about king david what's the point that's trying to be made losing his uh virility yes he's not virile anymore he's an impotent old man so clearly clearly he cannot be a good king no cialis for him 
um, that, that 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 can't be the solution. So you got you got to have a king who you know is full of manhood and virility. that's as much of that much of a conversation I want to have with my parishioners. Moving on, what geographical regions are represented in the competing claims of Adonijah? And Solomon, who are the two sons claiming to the throne, they represent different geog geographical regions of the kingdom, though. That sounds. Adonijah represents David's past in Hebron, when Hebron had been the, the David's base, his, his center, while Solomon, born in Jerusalem, is supported by those in the new capital city. And so some scholars actually suggest that historically part of what was going on here was uh, a resistance once again to the capital being made into Jerusalem um, from older important sites. And so Jerusalem, so, you know, it's kind of like when the capital, like when the capital of the country moved from New York down to Washington, D.C. Um, so you could see um, Adonijah as being of the New York crowd and uh, Solomon being of the D.C. crowd um, supporting that move. It was a great idea. And so Solomon kind of represents that central centralization, which is why he plays such an important role in the temple as well, because the temple is a part of that centralizing as well. It's a central it's a centralization, not just. Um, politically and from a governmental standpoint, but it's a central centralization from a religious standpoint as well. That's such an important um, key to get. Um, whereas before, of course, the people were worshiping wherever there's a high place, there'd be a shrine to God, you know, Bethel, Hebron, all of these places, Shiloh being the ancient, you know, one of the most ancient. Um, but those, those high places in the Deuteronomic history are seen as suspect because you know, we can't we, we, we can't really keep our thumbs on the people in these high places. And so these local shrines have a tendency towards idolatry. So we're going to get rid of them all and make people come to Jerusalem to worship. Um, it's a, a resistance of folk religion is how some scholars have painted it. Who are the people that conspire, two people specifically, to have Solomon anointed with king and how, as king and how do they do it? Solomon's mother. Solomon's mother, Bathsheba. Excellent. And then yeah. who's number two? Yeah, it's definitely Bathsheba. And uh, is it Jeff, Jebediah? No. No. The, the prophet um, Nathan. Yes, Bathsheba. And do you remember what they do, how they kind of talk David into doing this? Uh, no, but I know it's not good. They meet in advance and they're like, you know, Adonijah seems to be claiming the throne. So we've got to get the throne for David. I mean, for Solomon. And they're like, so let's do this. Let's go. And you go in and you're like, hey, why is that not? Didn't you promise the throne to Solomon, David? And then the prophet, and then the, the next one will go in and be like, yeah, hey, but I thought you promised the throne to Solomon. And then David will be like, oh, yeah, I absolutely made that promise. Solomon is king. We don't know for a fact whether or not there was an oath that David made that Solomon would reign. So we don't know if the if Nathan and Bathsheba are reminding David of his earlier promise. It's a possibility. Or if they're convincing an old kind of mind addled king that he said something he never said. It kind of it kind of runs like a, like an episode of the TV show Succession. Uh, if you ask me, I'm watching that right now on HBO. It's a similar sort of thing. It's like you can't really tell who's in charge at top and who's conniving to make what happen. When David dies, he gives um, Solomon, who is now king, some some bits of advice. Do you remember what 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 kind of advice Solomon uh, received from his father David? Well, no, I don't remember, but I can, I see it. <laughs> He tells no. him who should be rewarded and who should be punished. Oh. These are the people you got to take care of. These are the people you want to get rid of. And he includes, uh, encourage him to get rid of Joab, who had been his right-hand man, loyal soldier for years, who had been a part of so many of the key, of the key plot points of the Davidic narrative. Um, Joab is now at the end of his life seen as suspect by David. And uh, so he encourages Solomon to get rid of him. Chapter two, David dies. The kingdom is consolidated. Uh, why? So in, when, after this happens, Bathsheba comes and says, hey, why don't you give that? Remember that virgin Abishag that, you know, King David never was able to have sex with? Why don't you give her to Adonijah? You know, this is a, it's a, nice, it's a, it's a nice thing you do. Give, give this woman to another man. It's friendly. It's cheerful. It's, it's like a cake, like a casserole. 
So you know, why, Solomon, why don't you go ahead and give, you know, Ad- Adonijah wanted the throne. He didn't. So he didn't get the throne. Give him, give him the young virgin. The nice thing. Solomon doesn't like this idea, and it's not because he's opposed to giving women away as property. Um, hint, hint. Um, w- right. w- why does Solomon react so strongly to this idea, and how does he respond? Well, it would be like giving him a scepter or a throne. It, yes. Giving him a symbol of. Uh, yes, kingship. Solomon. Solomon is wise. He knows that a claim on the concubine of the king is a claim on the throne. Um, this is what, uh, remember, it's what Absalom did when he laid claim to the throne. He slept with uh, King David's concubines and in, in the sight of all of the people. So this is a claim on the throne. Uh, and in response, Solomon is Adonijah killed. He, 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 he's not allowed to remain uh, in the narrative anymore because of that act. Now, did Adonijah intend it as a claim on the throne? Or is this Solomon being ruthless and ensuring there are no challenges? The text is not clear. It depends on how you interpret the story, whether this was a wise move or if this is kind of representing more of the brutality and power and overreach of Solomon. I think both. It's, 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 odd. it's odd that he would try that. It's odd that Bathsheba went along with it. Or did Bathsheba recognize, oh, oh, this is not going to go well. This is a chance to get rid of him because she, yeah. she must have wanted to get rid of him Yeah, all along it, as a threat. And it's hard to tell, you know, in the first part of Solomon's reign before the apostasy, it, sections that we didn't cover in the reading because I can't cover everything in an overview course like this. But there, there's a lot of talk about Solomon's wealth his money, all of this lavish riches he gets. And one way of interpreting that is God had said, because Solomon asked for wisdom instead of wealth, he's going to get wealth anyways. But the Deuteronomic history is very suspect on a centralizing of wealth in the monarch. Um, And so there's a line of thinking that all of these stories of the lavish wealth of Solomon aren't meant to describe how wonderful he was, but are an indictment of him. That he used his wisdom to collect power and resources. The text doesn't say that. The text is ambiguous on the question of whether or not it was a good or bad thing. So, it, so it, like like this other question, it depends on how you interpret the text. Um, and so, some scholars take that as being an example of the kind of the seeds of Solomon's apostasy even early on, while others see that as before he went bad, when God was still blessing him with wealth. So, I mean, you can uh, kind of pick. I think uh, in here it, it, it even is condoning trickle down uh, theory <laughs> because it tells how solomon's got everything gold and then in jerusalem it says silver was common it was everywhere so everyone's got silver at least and solomon's got all the gold hmm. yeah. yeah but that's <laughs> jerusalem and the rest of the oh, country yeah, doesn't the rest take of the place, kindly so. to that yeah. no yeah. no Everyone's always rejected those those bandits within the bout way, right? <laughs> um, when Solomon oh asks for oh wisdom and is given wisdom, there's an inclusio um, in the story that, that that's presented. An inclusio is a literary device where you have something at the beginning and something at the end, which frames the story and helps you understand it. There's a certain inclusio at work in the story of Solomon's wisdom, something he does at the beginning of the story and something he does at the end, which is telling you something. Does anyone remember that? I didn't use the word inclusio last week when I taught, um, but I did talk about this framing happening. Does anyone remember what the frame was, the, the, the shift that happened in Solomon? At first, he worships the high place. But after he receives divine wisdom, he ends the story by worshiping at Jerusalem. So there's a subtle, once again, it's that foreshadowing of what's going on and kind of that concern of centralizing worship. Well, you know, once Solomon had divine wisdom, he didn't worship at high places anymore. He chose the proper place of worship uh, to worship in Jerusalem. So there's that movement happening there, even then in the story of the wisdom of Solomon. Um, And as well, I just wanted to, because we kind of had to rush a little bit um uh through this but just to acknowledge the, the the temple itself and um if there are any questions anyone had about the kind of the design of the solomonic temple that we 
kind of went through as quickly as we could. Uh, it's a magnificent space, as you can see. Um, and, and, and just to be clear, after this is destroyed in the Babylonian exile, and then is later rebuilt by Ezra and Nehemiah in the exiles, the temple of Nehemiah was a humble affair. It was not nearly as gorgeous as the Solomonic temple. Um, not, not even close. And so, um, it, 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 so it was the Solomonic temple that Herod was seeking to kind of bring back in all of its glory when he rebuilt the temple um, uh, himself in the, in the first century BC and leading it to the first century uh, CE. Um, but a beautiful- it didn't work out well for Herod. No, no. But Herod, you, he got no respect. Yeah. He built this lovely temple for the Jews and they despised him. Um, he sponsored the Olympics, yeah. and the Greeks still despised him. I don't get no respect. Hey, take 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 these Israelite people. No, I mean really, take them. You get it? it's like a, it's a little danger field joke for you. Um, <laughs> good, good stuff. Well, let's go ahead and dive in with chapter one of First Kings. Let me grab my Bible, which is sitting right here. Oh, wow, yeah, I was way ahead. Chapter one, First Kings. Excuse me, not chapter one, chapter eight. Chapter eight okay. of first Kings. Q. Yeah, I was like, whoa. I, I was like, like, wow, I did a great yeah. job. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, wow. I, mean, I thought it was like ahead. Sure. First Kings chapter eight. Uh, like I said, I'm skipping over all of this stuff about all of the wealth of Solomon and all of his wives, the story of the visit of the Queen of Sheba, um, because I just can't cover all of that. Um, but all of that's happening to lead up to this, including the building of <laughs> Solomon's own house, which is this gorgeous affair uh, that brings us eventually to. Um, chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the leaders of the ancestral houses of the Israelites, before King Solomon in Jerusalem to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. All the people of Israel assembled to King Solomon at the festival in the month of Ithanim, which is the seventh month. And all the elders of Israel came, and the priests carried the ark. So they brought up the ark of the Lord, the tent of meeting, and all the holy vessels that were in the tent. The priests and the Levites brought them up. King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel who had assembled before him were with him before the ark, sacrificing so many sheep and oxen that they could not be counted or numbered. Then the priest brought the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to its place in the inner sanctuary of the house, in the most holy place underneath the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread out their wings over the place of the Ark, so that the cherubim made a covering above the Ark and its poles. The poles were so long that the ends of the pole were seen from the holy place in front of the inner sanctuary, but they could not be seen from outside. They are there to this day. There was nothing in the ark except the two tablets of stone that Moses had placed at Horeb when the Israelites made a covenant with the Israelites, when the Lord made a covenant with the Israelites when they came out of the land of Egypt. So everything has been leading to this chapter. Um, and this chapter lays out the ideological program really by which the rest of Kings must be understood. So chapter eight is, is a really central chapter in the story of first Kings. The boundaries of chapter eight are marked by the movement of the people. At the beginning, a solemn assembles a roster of the leaders and every Israelite gathers. He brings them all together. At the end of this chapter, Solomon sends them all away rejoicing. So there's this movement of the people forming an inclusio here again, or a bookend of what's going on, which is emphasizing in the view of the author of First Kings um, that this is indeed a united nation coming together around a centralized temple. And what we see in this story of chapter eight is our old friend, the chiasm. Now, if you remember from we way back at the beginning of our intro to the Hebrew Bible, we talked a little bit about chiastic structure. It comes from the Greek word chi, which is an X like this. And a chiasm is when you have A, then B, then C, then D, and then C restated, B restated, and A restated. So it kind of moves like this, and the key of a chiasm is always in the center. That's what the chiasm leads to and then away from. And, you, and that's what's actually going on here in chapter eight. And so here is an example of it for you is, uh, to see. Um, so there's a narrative action, verses 1 through 13, which is the transfer of the ark. There's a theological commentary on that action in verses 14 through 21. There's a prayer for the dynasty, a transition in 
the, the, what's known as the seven petition prayer, which is more for the people and religion, a transition out, another theological commentary, and then a final narrative action, which is focused on the sacrifices that are done in the newly dedicated temple. So can you see how that kind of moves with like A, and then at the bottom, A restated, B, B restated. And then in this chiasm, it's C and C restated. There's not a specific different middle. But what you can see then is this prayer, which forms the center of the chiasm, is what is key to the narrative of chapter eight. Um, does that make sense? Questions? Yes, I have a question. Please. This has happened a couple of weeks in a row now. I've been reading Second Kings, and we're talking about First Kings here. So, how am I getting this wrong? Because I thought that the, you know, I thought the instructions specifically stated Second Kings eight to eleven. Oh, is, is that it's, not correct for this week, or not, or what? Again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. Second no, Kings. Yeah. First, I would just say when you send out your instructions for next week, please double check and make sure we got the right reading because I didn't read any of this. Let me check one second here. It was it was second written second. Did I say second? Yeah, yeah. last week and this this week. So if y'all could do me a favor, if th this email goes to like 25 or 30 people, if you ever happen to notice that I'm doing a mistake like that, please reply to me. Um, and that way I can correct it for people that may not know um, that I, I've, I've put a typo in there. So if you happen to notice that typo and you <laughs> can tell it's a typo because you know we're still in First Kings and not the Second Kings yet, I will, I will try to get that right. I'm sure I got that right this because I know I got it wrong last time. Um, so I'm sorry about that, Christine. But if you do notice that, please, you know, shoot me an email and then that'll give me a chance to let people know so that people don't spend all their time read. I mean, don't get me wrong. Second Kings is beautiful. It is. Um, but, but I wouldn't know the difference. I wouldn't know if it's right or wrong because no, I'm yeah. such a novice in all of this. You're I know, fine. Carolyn, you you picked up on it, you know, when you started you reading about right, but Queen of Sheba you, or somebody. When we get to that, and I assume we will get to that, you will be so ahead of us. You are. <laughs> please. Yeah, please. I feel so behind right now. Okay. Quit reading ahead. Quit I, reading I think ahead. We're... Thank you. Thank you. So, I'm sorry about that, Christine. I apologize. No big deal. Um, uh, so yeah, we're in first kings. First king. And, and, and you can always know as well, we move chronologically through the text. And so um, I, I generally, you'll know when we're going to move into second Kings. So if I've been talking about first Kings chapter one or chapter two in the class, and then I send out an email saying, and now in second Kings, you can be like, are we already in second Kings? That, that can also be a clue. Um, just so you know, I, I generally won't jump to a new book without letting the class know. Okay. Um, so I don't know if that'll be helpful too, but um, I once yeah. again, I'm sorry about that. Well, that's quite all right. Quite all right. I'll know for next time. Other questions? I mean, does the chiasm exist? Chiasms exist throughout scripture. It's a very common literary device in the biblical text um, in both the Old and New Testaments. And so once you understand the work of chiasms, it'll really be helpful for you understanding various stories. Yeah, Matt. Isn't it just basic logic? Um, a, B, the purpose, you got A, A, B, 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 C. And at the end of the day, it's just comes down to basic logic, which either the you know people that were writing it way back when understanding the basic logic they could have or somebody else kind of transitioned it that way does that make sense yeah i wouldn't say it's basic logic because it, it it's one possible way of structuring information you know a chiastic structure like not every chapter of the bible or every section of the bible is a chiasm it's a it's a literary device that's that's commonly used but not regularly used um it, so. it recalls the advice they used to give you about teaching or, or a sermon mm -hmm. you tell them what you're going to tell them and then you tell them and then you tell them what you told them yeah. And, and if, you, if you ever pay attention, I, I actually do this in my sermons. Um, for example, example in my sermon this uh, two Sundays ago, um, I used the form of an inclusio. Um, the, at the beginning of the sermon, I raised this question and I said this. And then I did the whole sermon. At the end, I went back to the very first thing that I said. Only now you hear that differently given what happened afterwards. So, it, it, so it, it's a rhetorical move that can be used in rhetoric as well as a literary device that can be used in writing. Um, and, and, and as well, there's something about it, not only does it function well rhetorically, but it kind of, it, to get what Matt's saying, it's pleasing to the mind. Even if you don't know it's a chiasm, 
as you're reading it go like this and then back like this that order feels good in your head even if you don't explicitly recognize that's what you're seeing there's something about information going in that way that just kind of because it feels like it makes more sense like matt saying like it feels logical and reasonable that it's a really good literary tool to kind of bring people through good good that's good stuff um so then uh the arc of the after the arc, arc of the arc of the covenant is brought in um so we're still in that. We haven't read more. So remember, the ark had been in a tent, right? It had been in the tabernacle, the tent of meeting in a sanctuary, uh, which was the tent sanctuary in the city of David, the old city of David. And it's, it's not really clear the difference between Jerusalem, the city of David, and Zion at this point. Most likely, these are different parts of the Temple Mount. Um, what becomes the Temple Mount, the top of the of the of the mountain upon which Jerusalem is built. Um, but there's some movement that does seem to take place from wherever it was on top of that mountain that the tabernacle was. There's movement from that to the place where the temple is constructed. Um, so that so that's remember that's where the ark is at this point in the story. Um, the story itself takes place, it says, during the festival, and it says it's the festival of the seventh month. So that would be the festival of the tabernacles. Uh, as I talk, if you remember, I talked about that in a sermon a little bit about the Feast of Sukkot, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, which recalls, right, the giving of the law um, during which the people dwell in tents. Do you remember when they lived in tents? So it makes sense to move the ark from a tent into the temple at the Feast of Tabernacles. That's a reasonable thing. To the Deuteronomistic mind as well, doing it on this festival implies a ceremonial renewal of the covenant. The, the law that we give thanks for, that we remember every year at Sukkot, is being renewed right now when we're moving the temple. And that's a part of what we see going on in chapter eight as well. The poles remain in the ark. You don't, you know, you use the poles to carry it. There's no reason to leave them in, but, uh, but they're left in the ark here so that even though the ark cannot be seen, you can see those poles sticking out and they become this visible reminder of the presence of the ark, which is hidden behind those gold doors, if you remember. Um, the last, the last time I mentioned the ark, wasn't there something else in it? Yes, thank yes. you, Carolyn. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Where, where's, where's the, the staff of Moses? The staff of Moses and the manna, right? That's yeah. absolutely. So what most scholars think is going on here is you're getting two different authors. So the Deuteronomy, the mystic author. All he cares about is the law. And so it's the law that's in the ark. The priestly author, which is a different source in the Torah, um, the priestly author is the one that wants to talk about the, um, the staff and the manna. Um, and so what you're getting is two, two different traditions, oral traditions that existed about this time in Israel. And at this point in the story, the Deuteronomy is totally taken over. But if you remember back, the priestly story, which is generally told in Exodus, that story did tell us more about a lot of this stuff. And that the priestly story, for example, is fine with worship in, in the various places around Israel. The priestly narrative has no problem with Jerusalem, with um, worship in the high places. It's the Deuteronomist, the, the later editor, that doesn't like that and so pulls that away. And some scholars think that the remove the the, 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 pre, the Deuteronomist, not not including the 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 the, the staff and the manna, is because the Deuteronomist wants to get away from this idea of magic magical powers and really emphasize following the law, the law of God might be a reason why the Deuteronomist shades history differently. Great catch. Excellent catch you two. Fantastic job. Great. Any, any a question, any other questions on that? So let's go ahead and push through into verse 10. And when the priests came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Then Solomon said, the Lord has said that he would dwell in thick darkness. I have built you an exalted house, a place for you to dwell in forever. A cloud is often associated with divine presence, right? We've heard this happen over and over again in the story of the Bible. Um, what are some other examples you can think of of, uh, the one I give here, of course, is the uh, when the tabernacle was completed in Exodus 40, a cloud covered the tabernacle. But what are some other examples you can think of of times when when the God appeared in a cloud? And during the Exodus. Yes, yeah. the Exodus, right? Yeah, and that it was a cloud that led them through wherever Excellent. they were going. Excellent, Christine. Good. Anyone else? 
you get this as well in the in the in the call of Isaiah, right? When the when the when the when the cloud fills the temple, right? It, it, it's it, it's a common narrative motif. Uh, like Moses, um, the priests could not perform their service because the glory of the Lord. That was the exact same thing that happened in um, in Exodus in Exodus forty. That Moses could no one can see to do what they're doing because the cloud is so thick in the temple. This is also drawing from a tradition that God is a God who exists wrapped in clouds and remains a mystery. Mm -hmm. We see that in Deuteronomy 4, Psalm 18. Um, this is what we hear in, uh, I'll get you one second, Matt. This is what we hear in, in Eucharistic prayer D, O God who dwells in light inaccessible from before time and forever. The, the, the cloud also emphasizes that, that, that God is in some ways <clears throat> present. Um, imminently present with us and yet god remains transcendent and mysterious and beyond our conceptualization it, it's a really wonderful of holding that tension yeah matt go ahead um do you think the cloud also could mean what a dust storm habu something like that i mean that would make sense in the the desert lands when those things come in everything shuts down i mean yeah. you're nobody's going anywhere i mean even yeah, so maybe that's it. I don't know. And it's an interesting question, Matt. I don't know in the Hebrew if those two words are different, if they use the same word to describe the experience of a dust storm moving in and a cloud, because the experience from a physical standpoint is very similar, as you're noting. And I'd be very curious to find out if it's the same Hebrew word for both. Um, and so you could understand it or translate it in either sort of way. But it's certainly an, an experience that in ancient desert people would understand is the wind moving in such a way that I can see nothing, right? Mm -hmm. That you get that immediately. Good, good point. Yeah. Others. Yeah, Tony. Yeah, I'm just curious. Uh, are there any cloud references in, uh, are we, do we say Christian Bible or New Testament? Uh, what is the best way to say it? New Testament, since we don't oh. say Old Testament? No, you, I, I would say New Testament. That's a good question. I say New yeah. Testament instead of Christian Bible. And that's, okay. so, that's only because the Old Testament is a, the Hebrew Bible is a part of the Christian Bible. What people do do if they want to shade it differently, though, to be attentive to that reality, Tony, of yeah. not wanting to be supersessionist, is some yeah. people will say the Hebrew Bible and the Greek scriptures. Um, oh, very good. That'd be based on language as opposed to old or new. Yeah. But there's, well, I have a friend that's married to a Jewish woman, and so he has some Jewish friends, and he says they hate it when Christians refer to the Old Testament. Yeah. But anyway, I'm just curious, are there any cloud references in the New Testament? Well, I, I, I think I can picture some, but I can't nail it down. Can anyone think of any? The Transfiguration. Oh. Yes. yes. What's that? I'm sorry? Transfiguration, transfiguration. She said, "Oh, okay." Where Christ that, that went up in the cloud a couple times there, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, and that was did. the that that was emulating Shukat, wasn't it? Uh, yeah. With the tabernacles, the Shekinah presence of God. Absolutely. There's also commonly in 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 the Gospels when they talk about the second coming of Christ, that the Son of Man will be coming in a cloud. Mm -hmm. with yeah. power and great glory and we tend to think of that as like jesus riding on fluffy clouds which is kind yeah. of a stupid idea <laughs> i've always thought that that's much more about the shekinah presence glory of god that, that jesus comes in that jesus comes in that kind of a cloud um is sort of what's been saying um it's also a cloud that takes jesus out of sight in the ascension narrative um as well mm -hmm. um that's another place where you wind up seeing yeah. it um yeah i mean the even even at the crucifixion, um, the clouds moved in. A storm moved in. So there's another reference to clouds. When when when, when I mean that's when the temple was broken. Everything or else, it, or was it just darkness? Just darkness, I think. I, I, I could be wrong. I think it's just darkness. The, 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 I did thank you, Matt, for pointing out the, the temple thing. I wanted to point that out. If you catch when the temple, when the splitting happens, it's the, the curtain of the temple that separates the Holy of Holies is what's torn in two. That's the curtain of Herod's temple. And it's interesting, if you pay attention in Solomon's temple, it was not a curtain that separated the two, but folding gold doors. How not that interesting? Um, I, I actually had not caught that difference until la last week when we were going through our construction of the temple um, information. Good. 
So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an important smoke. And the, well, the other thing, of course, is um, when God appears to Abraham, right, in, in, in the form of a smoking, a smoking pot, smoking fire, or something like that. Um, that that's one of the most ancient theophanies that we have, where God appears in either smoke or in fire or in cloud. These are all very common. Um, uh, it met, and, and this is why, of course, incense has been used in, in, in worship for such a long time because it helps um, not only um, help us to uh, experience the presence of God with that symbol of the clouds of incense moving, but uh, the clouds of incense wind up being a dual image because they also can symbolize the prayers of the people ascending to heaven in a cloud. Um, so it's, it, 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 it's, it's a good metaphor that's used in, in the Bible and religion. There's, of course, an art. Um, anytime God is depicted, you know, he's the old man in the clouds. Yeah. And, um, That's where they stick it always, right? Kind of a gentle guy. Kind of yeah, like Santa actually, Claus. Kind of like Santa Claus in a robe is generally, I feel like what a lot of those pictures look like. Um, yeah. <laughs> All right. I, let's I love it. I saw something online about a, a pastor um, that put, all that kind of stuff and then put she really loves you god does <laughs> right it's like you don't know <laughs> you <have no> clue. <laughs> good let's let's go ahead and pu push forward into um uh verse 14 verse 14 and we'll go to 21 this is in the chiasm we've had the action now we have the theological commentary oh one second Getting a message from Bethany. Uh oh. We'll call as well. I'll text her and see what she says. Um, she just asked me to call her when class is done. So that usually means she needs me to pick something up at the store and wants to make sure I don't forget. Uh, but I'll text her to make sure. Um, so beginning in verse 14. Then the king, so this is Solomon, turned around and blessed all the assembly of Israel while all the assembly of Israel stood. He said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who with his hand has fulfilled what he promised with his mouth to my father David, saying, Since the day that I brought my people Israel out of Egypt, I have not chosen a city from any, other, any of the tribes of Israel in which to build a house, that my name might be there. But I chose David to be, to be, but I chose David to be over my people Israel. My father David had it in mind to build a house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. But the Lord said to my father David, you did well to consider building a house for my name. Nevertheless, you shall not build the house, but your son who shall be born to you shall build the house for my name. Now the Lord has upheld the promise that he made. For I, oops, ah, stop. Now the Lord has upheld the promise that he made. For I have risen in the place of my father, David. I sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised and have built the house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. There I have provided a place for the ark in which is the covenant of the Lord that he made with our ancestors when he brought them out of Egypt. So this is kind of Solomon giving us a theological context as to what's happening. Um, giving really the, the, the context for the temple, its dedication, what where this falls in the story of David and the story of, of Solomon. We know this story if we've been following it throughout, but this is a nice encapsulation of what's going on. Solomon begins, notice, with a prayer for the Davidic dynasty, um, uh, of which he is a part, conveniently enough, but then moves on to a God who is without equal, but who keeps his covenant, particularly his covenant with David. Um, God has kept that promise that David's son would build the temple. And so Solomon prays that God will keep a second promise. The northern kingdom um, is what we'll see in the verses that will follow. Um, the, the, the nation will be enabled to remain together and united. Um, then in, uh, in uh, verse 22, we get the, the prayer for the dynasty. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel, spread out his hands and seven, and to heaven and said, Hear, O Lord, God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath, keeping covenant and steadfast love for your servant to walk before you with all their heart. The covenant that you kept for your servant, my father David, as you declared to him, you promised with your mouth and have this day fulfilled with your hand. 
Therefore, O Lord God of Israel, keep for your servant, my father David, that which you promised him, saying, There shall never fail you a successor before me to sit on the throne of Israel. If only your children look to their way to walk before me as you have walked before me. Therefore, O God of Israel, let your word be confirmed which you promised to your servant, my father David. So you see that movement from just a generalized prayer for the dynasty to which is now, of course, fulfilled in David in this temple. And, and so, God, can you also? maintain the dynasty after me, that I will be that. This is a language of the Deuteronomistic tradition, this prayer which pleads for the continuation of the Davidic dynasty, but recognizes that the continuation of the dynasty is going to be conditional on the faithfulness of the monarch. And those who know this story that know that in the end the monarchy proved unfaithful and therefore the throne of David was lost, this prayer is explaining why that happened. Uh, by looking back to the time when Solomon prayed, God would grant that. But even Solomon said, if we are faithful, God will grant that. In the section that follows, that we're not going to read all of chapter 8 because we, we well, I want to do a little bit more tonight than just the dedication. But the temple is situated not as the place God dwells. We want to believe God doesn't live in the temple. But instead, this is a place for God's name, for a symbol of God's presence. And so when people pray in the temple or pray toward the temple, that he is that the God who is in heaven, God is transcendent in heaven, that that God will hear. So there's not a confusion going on here that this is literally a house for God. This is a place for God's name. When the people pray in or towards it, God who is transcendent in heaven will hear the prayers of God's people. Um, and then we get the seven petition prayer I mentioned, um, which is really interesting. It describes a, a catalog of kind of paradigmatic crises that might happen in the course of the nation and during which an answer to prayer would be critical. Um, and so it's situating the temple as being the place where these kind of prayers will happen when the nation finds itself in a time of crisis. Questions, thoughts? That's all I'm going to cover of chapter eight, because I do want to do a little bit of, of the next chapter, chapter 11. But that's the dedication of the temple. And you can see this kind of, it's setting out the way we're going to understand why things go wrong. And it, it's, at the beginning, there's a reason given for how that might happen. So go ahead and skip ahead a few verses to chapter 11. Excuse me, a few chapters to chapter 11. Um, beginning in verse 1 of chapter 11. King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women, from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the Israelites, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for they will surely incline your heart to follow their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. Among his wives were 700 princesses and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. For Solomon followed Astarte, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not completely follow the, follow the Lord as his father David had done. And then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites, on the mountain east of Jerusalem. He did the same for all his foreign wives who offered incense and sacrificed to their gods. Earlier, the emphasis had, uh, in the story had been Solomon's love of Yahweh, Solomon's love of the Lord, which was the basis of his request for wisdom in, in chapter three. That was the reason he asked for wisdom. We're told it's because Solomon loved the Lord. That same love is the word used here to describe his sin um, in, the, in the way that his love for his wives led him away, led him astray from his commitment to God. Um, well, the modern may uh, the modern I should say reader may see intermarriage as a necessary political act in the ancient world the deuteronomist views it clearly as a violation of the law but just to be clear the problem isn't that he had like a thousand sexual partners well the, yeah that that's what i was just i mean like that's dude, fine. Dude, 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 well i mean that's okay but man yeah the, the dude's got got some stamina yeah, I know, right? The problem would be that these are from foreign nations. And remember, the Deuteronomist is very opposed to um, intermarriage. And it's the Deuteronomist view, which is followed in Ezra and Nehemiah, when after the exile, they tell people to put aside the foreign lives, wives. But remember, 
this point about all oh, these horrible foreign women that lead you astray, there's a contrary understanding of this, right? Because who is the grandmother of Maisie? Oh, Maisie, honey. It's Maisie, stop it. It's, it's the Al Anon people, honey. Be nice. Don't bark at them. Maisie, no. Hey. Um, who is David's grandmother? Do you all remember? Uh, not Obed. Um, um, Naomi? Um, Naomi. Close, close. Ruth the Moabite. Uh, Ruth. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. oh, Ruth, Ruth. Yeah, yeah Ruth the Moabite. So, yeah, so a, I was lot thinking, of, yeah. <laughs> a lot of scholars think, because the story of Ruth was written very likely around the same time as Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, and so a lot of people think that the story of Ruth represents the competing tradition. But the problem is not marriage to foreign wives. The problem is when marriage to foreign wives leads you astray. Because Ruth is a Moabite. I mean, every time she's mentioned in the Bible, she's called a Moabite. And yet she was an immensely faithful person um, and, and, and a hero of the ancient of, of, of the ancient Israelites. And so I, I would encourage you this all this the, the evilness of the foreign wives is one theological perspective in the Hebrew Bible, but even the Hebrew Bible does not agree with itself about whether or not that is the issue or not. That's an important point, I think, to make. Um uh, like I said, it's not the number of wives, it's their nationality and it's their religious accommodation. And as well, when it, you know, when it lists all of these gods, one of the gods it lists is Molech. And ooh, it doesn't say Solomon did this, but Molech is most known in Hebrew scripture for being the person that you sacrifice children to, oh. human sacrifice. Hence what you see the picture here. Of, of the child being offered in a sacrifice and, and that I gave. So that's, that is the, the horror of these. Um, and this is a real thing in the ancient world that they would do this. Um, and so, for example, you know, the story of Abraham's sacrifice of his son, Isaac, um, a lot of the one way of reading that is that is a clear repudiation of the practice of child sacrifice. Because though Abraham was willing to do it, God refused to allow it, making it clear that God is not a God that will ever really truly demand this of anyone, that this is not faithful worship. That's one reading of it. There are alternate readings as well. Um, but when, when they mentioned that he allowed a temple to Molech to be built, and all of this is being built on the hill east of Jerusalem, this is the Mount of Olives, if you know your geography. You know, the Mount of Olives, that's where Jesus, of course, went um, when he, you know, left Jerusalem. But, oh, gosh, I'm going too far. Ah! What happened? Uh, <laughs> I bumped the forward button on the on the show. That was hilarious. The Mount of Olives, which is the um, the place where Jesus goes right after they sing a hymn after the um, Last Supper. Um, it's the place where the uh, Garden of Gethsemane is. So that's the that's the Mount that this is all happening on. Uh, questions, thoughts. Mm -hmm. Fast foreshadowing. Yeah. <laughs> wow okay i have to answer uh oh sorry uh oh, i have a question ahead. about the western wall um yeah. is there any uh you know we were talking about prayers going up directly to god and everything and so and i think that with the western wall they they believe that as well is that correct and where does that where does that wall come in the history of all this is it in the hebrew bible Excellent question, Christine. So the Western Wall uh, is a part of Herod's um, temple complex. So what happens in the first century CE when Herod, uh, BC, when Herod <laughs> begins the construction of his temple, you know, he takes this kind of shoddy thing that Ezra and Nehemiah built, this kind of this, not, not like the glory of the Solomonic temple, and he wants to make something gorgeous. So what Herod actually does is he <laughs> takes the temple mount, which is like this, and he builds retaining walls up on either side of the mount to make a gigantic flat platform. The, the western wall is the western side of those retaining walls. Okay. They were built around the tip of the mountain so that this gorgeous gigantic temple complex could be built on a flat surface. Um, so the, the western wall is not technically a wall of the, of the, of the Herodian temple, but is a retaining wall from the temple mount. 
uh, mm-hmm. that Herod wound up constructing. Um, but it, but it's still it's all that remains of Herod's temple. The, of course, the temple itself is long gone, and so it's a deeply uh, religious place for for Jews. Um, and if you've ever, I, I, I've I've if I've been in Jerusalem um, on on Shabbat, mm-hmm. and and you, it is a party, Friday <laughs> night. Is people are going to the temple to the Western Wall, they're singing, they're dancing, they're rejoicing. It's a very amazing experience. Um, uh, also, very closely guarded. You don't get into the area where the Western Wall is until you go through a couple metal detectors. Um, but it's also very friendly. I when I when I was in Jerusalem, I prayed at the Western Wall as a priest. Um, and when I left, I didn't have my my collar wasn't quite visible. I think. And so someone, you know, when I was walking away, you know, kind of you walk away, step, walking backward before you turn and someone stopped me and said, hello, hello, are, are, where are you from? Then I said, oh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a priest from, uh, from America. And he said, oh, this is your home too. This is your city too. Do you have a place to eat Shabbat dinner? Come to my house, come eat Shabbat dinner with me. I was like, right. oh my, I would love to, but like I've got a bunch of pilgrims and we've got plans, but thank you. But like the hospitality, the joy, the welcome, you know, whatever, I mean, don't get me wrong, contemporary Israeli-Palestinian relations is a huge issue in our time. But the average Jewish person in Jerusalem is not, it doesn't resemble that picture. Um, the, same thing for the average Muslim in Jerusalem. They're, they're, these are just wonderfully good religious people who want to worship. And the powers that be would much rather have war and violence and fighting than peace and and, and a shared place of worship. Yeah, that's way more than you asked, Christine, but I just you brought up one of my favorite things. So I I put it out myself. (laughs) I I too have been to the Western Wall and uh, but it was in the 70s. So we didn't have to go through any metal detectors at that time. But I remember what a wonderful place that was, a wonderful feeling. And that's really cool that somebody came up to you and invited to you to Shabbat dinner. That what? was cool. Yeah. yeah was like, itch everybody, go. Right? I, was, I should have. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Chuck and Betty Weiber and uh, uh, Claire and Nancy Nesbitt and Travis, everyone who went with me from St. John. And I do want, my goal is eventually when Lucy's old enough to be able to go to Israel and be able to appreciate <laughs> the experience, I'm going to lead pilgrimages to Israel again um, because it's one of my favorite places in the world. Um, So stay tuned when Lucy's maybe closer to seven, eight, nine years old, then we'll we'll start looking to maybe doing a pilgrimage again and bring a whole bunch of you Mm -hmm. over there with me. It'd be fun. Yeah. Thank thank you for answering my question. You're welcome. Can I interject something briefly here? Because it's so it's so pertinent to what you were just talking about uh, with the political. There's a film that's just been released called Mayor. And it's a real-time documentary of the Christian mayor of Ramallah. Hmm. And uh, it involves the the time when Trump moved the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. It's a really good film. It played at the Knickerbocker here in Holland, Hmm. which is owned by Hope College. And if you get a chance to see it, it's it's really good. Wonderful. Thank you for that. That's it. (laughs) Thank you. So let's hear about how God responds to what Solomon does. Verse nine, and the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who'd appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this matter that he should not follow other gods, but he did not observe what the Lord commanded. Therefore, the Lord said to Solomon, since this has been your mind and you've not kept my covenant and my statute that I've commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and give it to your servant. Yet for the sake of your father, David, I will not do it in your lifetime. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. I will not, however, tear away the entire kingdom. I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. So the narrator seems to share God's anger with that impatient reference to God, Solomon's <laughs> obtuseness. God, the Lord had warned him twice, right? So the narrator clearly is annoyed as well. But because Solomon has deliberately failed, this wasn't an accident, this wasn't an oversight, has deliberately failed to keep the covenant. The conditional promise of the throne of Israel, a united kingdom is aborted. The kingdom will not be united. That had been the goal. And David was the one who did it and it's gonna be lost immediately. 
the punishment is delayed though because of David's past obedience. Um, and also the unconditional promise of Jerusalem is the place of God will persist despite Solomon's disobedience, disobedience. Well, which is kind of interesting when you think of, you know, the way David particularly is not always a perfect king, but David still, you know, remained faithful in a way Solomon did it towards the end. Um, and the way that, that, that David, when he sinned, would turn from his sin, would repent. And we're seeing Solomon, just like Saul, kind of persist in sin. And that those connections between Saul and um, Solomon are going to continue. I'm going to skip ahead to verse 33 here. Um, uh, uh, verses 33 through 39. Um, I'm going to bring the right stuff here. Yeah. Uh, this is because uh, he has for eleven thirty three. Yeah, this is because he has forsaken me, worshipped the Starty, the goddess of Sidonian. We've already done that. They just forsake that over again. Verse thirty four. Nevertheless, I will not take the whole kingdom away from him, but will make him ruler all of the days of his life for the sake of my servant David, whom I chose and who did keep my commandments and statutes. But I will take the kingdom away from his son and give it to you. That is a ten. This is I'm, I'm. I think I'm at twenty three. Oh, I'm at 27. Why did I say 33? Well, you, you were actually reading 34. That's okay. I mean, you were reading verse 30. You were reading Kings. I one, think I must have accidentally two, deleted a slide here. Because Okay, so what happens? Yeah, because I did delete a slide here. So what happens is all of these various people rise up against Solomon. So the prophecy is immediately fulfilled. One of them is Jeroboam, uh, Jeroboam, son of Nebat, who's an Ephraimite, um, and a servant of Solomon, um, and who appears, um, did I really delete that story? It's the best story I did. <laughs> Where Jeroboam rebels. Okay, yeah, let me back up then. Yeah, I must have deleted that story. Well, we're almost at the end of our time. So let me just tell you what happens. So Jeroboam comes. Um, he, this is the person who oversaw the construction of the temple. This is an important person. Uh, and he encounters uh, the prophet Ahijah, who's a Shilohite prophet, um, on the road, who's in a garment, and there are two of them alone. Ahijah takes hold of the garment he's wearing, tears it into 12 pieces, and then says to Jeroboam, take for yourself 10 pieces, for God says, I'm about to tear the kingdom from the hand of Solomon and will give you 10 tribes. One yeah. tribe will remain his for the sake of my servant David and also for the sake of Jerusalem. Uh, so if you remember the same thing that happened with Saul, right? Remember that, that when, when, when uh, the prophet went to leave, Samuel went to leave, Saul grasped his cloak and his cloak tore. And Saul said, that's what's going to happen to you. Your kingdom's going to be torn from you. Um, the reason is given then in verse 33, I just read, um, the limits of the judgment is reiterated again, that God's not going to take it in Solomon's time, that the Jerusalem is going to remain if 10 tribes are going to be given to Jeroboam, it's kind of strange that one remains uh, Judah, right? For sake of David in Jerusalem, that's only 11 tribes. Are we all good with our math here? 10 tribes to Jeroboam, God keeps one back. So it's possible that the reason on the math there is because Benjamin, is which is the missing tribe, is regarded as Jerusalem's own territory as a city-state, so it's not mentioned. Um, uh, the other reason that people will give is that maybe it's because the Levitical tribe, of course, serve in Jerusalem and they don't get they don't get land so that could be another reason why 10 tribes are given one remains so, so what that still doesn't add to 12 10 plus 1 is just 11 so there are a couple possible ways of interpreting that but what most scholars will insist is don't get caught up on math that's <laughs> not what's essential here what's essential is the northern kingdom of Israel pulls away the united kingdom is gone and the, what remains is the southern kingdom of Judah with Jerusalem at its center um and then uh so solomon of course decides he's got to kill jeroboam um which is interesting right god has foreordained jeroboam to take this so solomon does not do what forgiveness and consequences right like we learned in david solomon does not accept the consequences for his sin but seeks to forestall the judgment of god by killing jeroboam um which is what saul did right and so Jeroboam flees to Egypt, um, which is so fascinating. Egypt, that place of salvation or that place of danger. Um, it's mentioned that Shishak was the ruler in Egypt at that time. This is actually the first mention of a pharaoh uh, uh, by name in the book of, uh, in, in the Bible, in the Hebrew Bible. And Shishak was an actual pharaoh. Um, Shoshank the first is how it would be said in Egyptian, who ruled Egypt in 945 to 924 BC. And that's actually what helps us date 
the story of Solomon is because of this reference to Shishak um, uh, or Shoshank, the um, uh, the pharaoh. So Egypt remains this dual source of refuge and of danger at the same time. As the story ends, it says that, that Solomon slept with his, that there's more acts of Solomon. There aren't those written in the book of the annals of the book of the acts of Solomon. Those are probably the annals of the king. The, the, every king kept royal books of what they did. And it seems likely that the Deuteronomist used those as a source when writing this story. Um, and then Solomon slept with his ancestors and buried in the city of his father, David, and his son Rehoboam will succeed him. Um, so we, the, the Deuteronomist used the like one of his sources, the Acts of Solomon, but he's using those to tell a theological story about Solomon. Why it was Solomon became king, the initial wisdom and success of his reign, how the reign fell apart, and how that foreshadows the corruption that we're going to see go back and forth in a cyclical nature in the rest of the book of First and Second Kings. All right, went a little bit over again. I'm sorry about that. Questions, comments, thoughts? Well, this, thank you for your... Oh, go ahead, Barbara. This isn't related to the lesson, but how did the uh, vote come out? I didn't hear. Oh, the vote did. Yeah, let me go ahead and turn off the recording here since we're done. Uh, 